编舞开展。八一建军节到来之际，多名联合国官员表示，中国积极参与和支持联合国维和行动，是国际和平的坚定维护者和积极贡献者。As a permanent member of the UN to see 作为安理会常任理事国和联合国维和行动第二大输出国，中国的支持既重要又有政策后方形势，我们特别感谢中国支持行动中的联合国维和行动。六点到十九点限行。前方闯红灯摄像。前方闯红灯摄像。前方红绿灯路口直行，所有车道均可通行。公交车道十七点到十九点限行，当前可放行驶入。Doctor Wu, thirty seconds to go. Will there be more extreme weather? 前方限速摄像。Yes, I think as mentioned here, as Professor Grub mentioned, I think this week's the scientific new scientific knowledge will will emerge. I I think there is no ambiguity that it is happening, and the situation will continue to worsen mostly because we continue to emit more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Okay, thanks, Dr. Wu. Uh, you're listening now. It's our live broadcast for where today we've been talking about the deadly weather and its connection to climate change. And uh, let's have a short break. We'll be back in a minute. Unfortunately, our live stream of the tour of Ice Raven, the venue for the Beijing Winter Olympics speed skating event, has been cancelled due to force majeure. We'll therefore no longer have the live stream on our Facebook account, CRI Learn Chinese, and the Weibo account, China Plus, at 4.30 p.m. today as announced earlier. But do stay tuned to our sport podcast, Sideline Story, for the latest news on the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics and other sports updates. Join Sideline Story for the Qingding Sports Road and have fun. Hello, this is Michael Zhang. Greetings from Los Angeles of the Golden State of California. Thank you today for making me part of your team. I truly enjoy the debates we had and look forward to many more in the years to come. Hello, I'm Julia Seeds, the Secretary of the Embassy of Chile to China. It's been an honor taking part on your show and telling you about the situation in Chile and China. Wishing you all the best. 前方一点八公里内有多个闯红灯拍照。沿当前道路继续行驶一点八公里。Hello everyone, this is Hunaymat Khan, journalist from Pakistan, currently based in Tsinghua University. World Premier Institute is created to discuss current affairs by including experts from across the globe. I've always enjoyed the discussions and wish the team even more success and impact in the future.
助脚尖。前方闯红灯摄像，限速六十。请注意，你快睡着了。前方红绿灯，请注意，你正在开车。后果将。提醒你，开车上路，请勿疲劳驾驶。Wake up to the signs of driver fatigue by CRI Easy FM。大家好，我是和平和浪，我是陈辉宏。大家好，我是常志磊。大家好，我们是那位前辈。您现在收听的是轻松调频 Easy FM。Welcome back to World Today. The panel discussion with me, Ge Anna, in Beijing. We've been talking about how extreme weather put climate change in focus. Let's continue. Zhu Xieying and Liu Lingling led a one-two finish. You know, at the Tokyo Olympic Tournament, Professor Michael Brub. From energy and climate change at University College London, and Professor Bob Carr, industry professor of climate change and business at University of Technology Sydney. So let's continue our discussion. Professor Carr, a one theory we talked about is widely believed is that global warming is changing the jet stream pattern and caused the、uh, extreme weather, and we can't stop downpours and droughts from happening, but we can change our behaviors to. Slow the process of global warming.、Uh, that's why we see Paris Accord and countries setting targets to cut carbon emissions. So when we talking about global warming, and climate change, how urgent is the problem for world leaders to seriously address it? There is nothing more urgent. What we're talking about is pure extreme weather. 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 This is the way we live in the world now. The planet, the condition of life on the planet, has changed. What we've got to do, what we all know we've got to do, is to expedite the transition from our dependence on fossil fuels to a new economy dependent, a new world economy dependent on renewables. Bill Clinton said something years ago, which, which contains a great truth. The, the former U.S. president said, "Get quick, go on." 是啊，那那那，你怎么可能想得出来？问太多，鸡鸣两天的。And you can say about fossil fuel, the fossil fossil fuel age. 前方主路，限速摄像，限速六十。It it it blend because we became smarter. The human animal became smarter about the way of energizing our economy. So that's the reason that the big developments、uh, this year. And late last year, that have seen Japan, China, South Korea commit to new targets for 2050, or in China's case, 2060, which have seen the the climate activism of the new American president has been very very strong. Why the the in the lead up to the COP26 conference in Glasgow in November is so urgent. The crisis on climate really is whether. Human animal in organized society is capable of taking a big collective decision to get out of old-fashioned modes of production and energy and embrace those that are compatible with with human life on a planet that's not going to be degraded by、uh, an unmanageable increase in average temperatures. Doctor Wu, what do you make of Professor Carr's point? Yeah, I definitely echo Professor Carr's、uh, point in terms of sense of urgency.、Uh, I think as we have experienced, particularly this last month, actually July, all those extreme weather events, extreme、uh, climate conditions around the world,、uh, you know, literally all the scientists actually are shocked or surprised in terms of how fast, intense, actually,、uh, you know, with all the situations happening now. Because when they do the modeling work, they are all looking into the future. You know, next ten years, twenty years, you know, thirty, forty, fifty years, or even you know, by the end of this century, they, they, the scientific community has sort of correctly,、uh, to a certain extent, modeling, you know, done the modeling work in terms of what's going to unfold 
but somehow this year, even as she started last year, maybe the last few years, even more so this year, we're already living in it. So that's the sense of urgency. Uh, what does that, what does it require in terms of actions today? Of course, the two major things need to happen uh, now. We don't have the luxury to postpone any actions now. One is really mitigation, meaning we need to reduce dramatically the emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible, and ideally to stop uh, the emissions, uh, to hold the emissions as soon as possible in order to mitigate the climate change. Of course, in the meantime, because we are already living in it, it's not like looking the, into the future, the possibility of other, we are already living in the world of climate change. We do need to invest more heavily in adaptation and the resilience there. So yes, you know, uh, if you look at the Paris uh, Agreement, which is more like the multilateral mechanisms that with all the signatory countries that actually putting their commitments on the table, on one side it's fascinating to see actually more and more nations and countries actually are committing to achieving carbon neutrality uh, around the 2030. Uh, of course, uh, in, in reduce emissions around, you know, by 2030. Uh, but then when we put that all the commitments in the context of the urgency, somehow we see the major gap. Uh, we are literally now today looking at somewhere between the two point five to three degrees Celsius temperature to rise, while the Paris Agreement actually is committed to this below two degrees Celsius or even better, one point five degrees. So we are inadequate. We are lagging behind what we committed to. So that part needs to intensify. There's the other part, actually. So yes, of course, the global media, particularly Western media, have been overwhelmed by what's happening you know, in the U.S., in North America, in Europe, and even part of China. But somehow, we, you know, other parts of the world, the poorest countries there, right? Already we're seeing the dire consequences in those large economies there. Just imagine low-lying, you know, uh, island country states, uh, leaders those around the equator regions there, they are very unconstant, un you know, un unprecedented level of consequences there, which has not been brought adequately to the national international debate because they urgently need the commitment from major economies, particularly in the countries, to deliver the financial commitment of $100 billion every year, uh, at least now, actually, and continue to rise. Otherwise, it's, it's a life or death situation for them. Mm -hmm. But there is a point uh, made by many analysts. They say millions of people were hit by two big problems within these two years, extreme weather and the COVID-19 pandemic. And the economic downturn had failed to curb the accelerating impacts of climate change. So, Professor Grab, what do you make of these two challenges, especially how economic downturn could affect a country's efforts on battling the climate change? Well, I think... Um we're at a very interesting time in the, uh, the whole global effort to grapple with climate change. Uh, not just because of the science, um, but because if you look at what's happened with emissions, technologies, commitments, you get a very uh, On the one hand, things look very bleak. We've had several decades of warning, but global emissions have kept going up. Um, if you look more closely, the rate of increase has slowed down. Um, if you look actually at sort of global average per capita, uh, so per person, the global average looks like maybe it peaked a few years ago at about five tons of, of CO2 emissions per person. Uh, and, and so, you know, at the, the, the moment, increase emissions roughly uh, are tracking the global population, but obviously we need to, to hugely decouple mm -hmm. Um I think the, the uh, interesting things within that though are there has been enormous progress on technologies. Uh, solar energy 10 years ago was, was an extraordinarily expensive way of producing electricity. Now the International Energy Agency describes it as the cheapest electricity in history. Uh, we've seen great progress in wind energy, which has actually expanded and is now uh, it's more than solar in terms of current supplies. Both of those are growing rapidly in percentage terms. Uh, electric vehicles are looking increasingly attractive. So one can put on more rosy uh, glasses, as we would say in English, uh, and see a lot of positive developments as well. 
前方事故多发路段。Regarding COVID and the current double crisis, again, it seems to have this double-edged sense. On the one hand, it's a huge political distraction, and it also has knocked economies and made countries more in debt. On the other hand, it is really a stark warning about the risks and the costs of ignoring scientific warnings, and governments are now much more intimately involved. In uh, the, the, the economics of recovery, so it really is a political choice. Do countries want to use their deep involvement in recovery from COVID to, to try and restore things the way they used to be in terms of a fossil fuel-based economy, or is most of the resources and efforts going to go on the green economy, the emerging clean, renewable, uh, and electric technologies? Unfortunately, there also the signs are not great, um, though there's some areas of, of clearly a more green-oriented recovery. So, Professor Carr, how, how do you address these two big challenges? Well, I think we've got to say there are aspects of, of the pandemic that point to the, the greater challenge, the, the, the more existential challenge of climate. The pandemic reminds us that we can't protect ourselves from the world's, the world's, the planet's natural rhythms. Um, we can we can imagine that we're protecting ourselves from in all kinds of ways, but nature has a way of asserting itself. And that's more the case when it comes to the natural world response. Um, the planet's response to all the waste we've been generating and storing in the Earth's upper atmosphere and dumping in the oceans. Mm. Um, so the two challenges have got something in common. They challenge our easy assumption that we can do things to the planet and escape the consequences. So the two challenges, of course, Global warming is the more fundamental. Dr. Wu, what's your take on the on the balance in development and climate protection against the backdrop of COVID nineteen pandemic? Well, it's it's a very big question. I think probably humanity is still going through this sort of you know a soul search and reflection at this moment. Uh, a few ways of looking at it. One, we often say, let's not do not waste any crisis, right? Crisis, yes, it's devastating to see the consequences, the deaths, the losses. But the, on the other side, actually, there's always opportunity to be creative, right? And, uh, so one side of the learning is that the both virus, the pandem pandemic, and the climate change uh, uh, kill lives, right? And the people, uh, in particular, in that context, the climate change even more. They kill not only people but also lives in nature right it's devastating and uh, climate change also devastating you know uh, pretty much whatever the infrastructure uh, the essential services actually that build to support uh, you know human survival and development there so it's complicated right but i think the, the, the consensus is there right in mm -hmm. terms of yes you know COVID 19 uh, you know, the virus is really unfortunate, so we have to, you know, figure out how to grapple with that challenge as long as possible. In the meantime, if you look at the stimulus, right, when we were, you know, economic downturns, recessions there, uh, governments, in particular from our major economies, actually stepping up their efforts and it's uh, you know, uh, un unimaginable sort of uh, tendency of stimulus package together. Uh, so in order to, of course, on one side to rescue and relieve, but more importantly, to build back better, right? So I think that's the space we are in today in terms of how do we make sure in the build back better sort of uh, context post the COVID process to make sure uh, we're not necessarily addressing the virus pandemic issues there, which is another challenge, a parallel challenge. But in the meantime, to make sure we really invest in uh, infrastructure, the future there. Uh, so another way of looking at it probably as I think I echo very strongly uh, the point actually uh, made by Professor uh, you know, uh, Grab there, 
you know, it's, it's complicated. But the other way of looking at it is this is a glass in front of you know, on our desk, it's a half full, half empty, right? Mm -hmm. And particularly looking at the half empty side from the climate solution perspective, actually, we don't know what needs to happen. And this is a fascinating. So not only climate science, not scientific knowledge, but really from the solution perspective. We know what are the root causes, right? The fossil fuels, the emissions there. And we know where are, you know, from, we know, you know, uh, so there's a fascinating sort of a body of knowledge, experience, and cases already in place. And the finance is even jumping on board in terms of investing in the future, right? So all the dynamics is there. Somehow we do need to deep dive into this half empty part really understand why not right and um, particularly in the context of this sort of crisis a sense of urgency there including geopolitics there right this is a reshaping recite moment a pivotal moment of our time somehow uh, the global community seems to be lacking in terms of yes we know where we need to go we need we know we, what we need to do but somehow we just so far has failed to really get all the pieces together, working together to really address that. I think that part needs to be paid more attention. Mm -hmm. Professor Grubb, last week, energy and environment ministers from the G20 nations, they met in Italy, and reports say, first of all, it's a marathon talk, and secondly, uh, they recently reached a consensus on quitting coal in 2030. As a means of short-term economic stimulus. That's all the news we have. And week one of the Summer Olympics is just uh, about over. And China's performance has been tracking with expectations. I value and spoke to Mark Schreier, who follows China's sports scene, about some of the big stories coming out of Tokyo, including a China angle on Simone Billy's shot exit. Let's hear it. So yesterday, uh, in the Olympics, the biggest story was actually Simone Biles uh, dropped out of the team competition in gymnastics. Well, how does that have a China angle? You had this really interesting... Uh, and, and, uh, and some other developed countries. Climate change, science, unambiguous, uh, really serious problem, um, quite a lot of progress in new technologies, we need to be much more ambitious and aim for 1.5 degrees, um, which is the, the most ambitious end of the Paris Agreement. But it doesn't really look as simple as that viewed from uh, many developing countries and major emerging economies, because uh, something like 1.5 leaves very little space in the atmosphere for any further fossil fuel development at all. And their reaction is, well, that's because the risk of so much in its history. Uh, and in many cases, most obviously the US uh, and Australia actually are still emitting far more per capita per person. So, you know, why the, the demand to be suddenly massively more ambitious is simply unfair and unjust, at least unless the, risk, unless the rich world is willing to provide a lot more international finance. So you get the strong resistance from the developing world broadly, and India actually, I think, has become uh, quite outspoken about this, does not want to be pushed into commitments it thinks are unjust and might impede its development. Uh, China is in a slightly different position. It knows the seriousness of the issue. It's now amongst um, relatively high emitters uh, per capita, so it faces the problem that it's invested a lot in fossil fuels and now it's going to have to get out of it. So you see it's just a lot more wariness in the developing world about exactly what, what is it reasonable and fair uh, to expect. Um, given that historical uh, and indeed current background. This is not going to be easily resolved. This has been the tension in negotiation for a very long time. Um, the next crunch point will be the COP26 conference in November, and I think that will continue to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Professor Carr, uh, in your opinion, what is in the way of a, a consensus among G20 nations? Do the request from developing nations have a point? Yeah, everyone understands the validity of the the developing nations' view that they're seeking in their national aspirations nothing else than to uh, lift their people out of poverty the way the industrial world did 
uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, nonetheless, we have the opportunity of technology, um, technology that has a benign effect on the planet is becoming within the reach of the developed and developing world alike. Yeah, take, take the case of India. Um, India is very keen to make the point that it's on a trajectory and it's titled to elevate its people out of poverty. But in the Indian market, uh, the cost of solar power is plummeting. Plummeting. Um, and India has a chance of reaching its national goal of energy independence Renewables，先放逐户，迅速设想，迅速发射，嗯，the is healthy competition between China and India to become the giant of the renewable sector. What we need is collaboration between the US and China uh, to learn from one another in transitioning economies based on renewables. Competition in other areas, but on climate, as on pandemic management, collaboration, cooperation between the two great powers, uh, China and the United States. Um, what we need is for carbon-dependent countries like my own, like Australia, to stop listening to the voices of those arguing for the old economy and to say there are more jobs um, in the new economy and we are suffering from climate change and we need to be part of a great a great effort by humanity uh, to pull off this transition. Time's running out and everyone says this decade is absolutely vital. Um, what is encouraging is that individual businesses are seeing investment in fossil fuels as being too high risk and they are moving ahead of uh, of, of governments in the Western world, including Australia. Um, in fact, it's interesting to watch the wheels of the wheels of the private economy move. Uh, investors are simply not putting their money into thermal coal, thermal coal mines, or um, uh, coal-fired power in Australia. Even though the, the, the current government in my country has got a rhetorical attachment to coal-fired power. Dr. Wu, most of the developing nations, they believe the climate issue is a tug of war on the right to development and require, require developed nations to aid more help. What should the developed countries do to better facilitate the developing nations in dealing with climate change? Well, I, I think that's a common uh, question on the table, uh, particularly if you look at the UN process, the climate change, you know, you, we call UNFCCC, now of course the Paris Agreement at this moment, we always say like, you know, uh, common but differentiated responsibilities there. This is a sort of one key uh, sort of uh, pillar or fundamental, uh, uh, you know, uh, principle for the international process there. Uh, major issue here, I think historically we continue to, 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 to face this actually even leading up to COP26, you know, uh, later this year, mm -hmm. is that uh, one actually, uh, you know, this is a financial commitment and, uh, you know, committed uh, back in 2009 to Copenhagen Accord in the process and the industrialized countries are committed to this $100 billion every year leading up to 2020. That has never been delivered. And that dramatically actually compromised the trust uh, and confidence actually, uh, you know, among uh, the developing developing countries because just imagining, you know, just common sense if we, if we want to collaborate with each other, the, the trust and confidence, basically the fundamental elements there as a foundation to do that. So that's dramatically lacking at this moment. 
，前方主路限速摄像，限速八十。前方限速摄像，限速八十。Economy, industry, you know, infrastructure, everything will be right. So theoretically, this is exactly the platform that needs to really address this particular challenge collectively. But we also recognize, you know, within that G20, you have this, you know, seven G7, this developing nations, and then you have this, you know, large economies, but emerging economies, right? So the 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 this this is a that that has to be addressed, right? Of course, they themselves need to shoulder their responsibility. In the meantime, globally, they have to bear their consequences there as well. I think the latest uh, the research this week, actually, I think fascinating to see, you know, uh, the, the, the mortality cost beside the social cost, actually, of carbon emissions. Now, now we have better understanding of this sort of mortality cost, particularly from heat waves, right? Uh, meaning every 3.5 Americans, actually, over their lifetime, their emissions, about 4,000, uh, whatever the emission lifetime, will kill one person. That's about 4,434 metric tons. And so that's really putting this, the things in perspective. So hopefully somehow research or findings like that will somehow make a stronger point leading up to COP26 so that we'll be able to somehow really convince G7 uh, in particular uh, to take on their responsibility, really deliver this financial commitment that they committed to back in 2009. Otherwise, the international process will remain sort of standing there, not effective at all. Besides, of course, G20s, developing developing countries need to really dramatically address the issue and the situation. Professor Grab, what's your take? What should the developed countries do to better facilitate the developing nations? Well. The the problem always is it, it's easy to, to ask and very hard to get. Clearly addressing the finance problems, issues in the 100 billion would be an immense help. Um, we've had a difficult but again mixed history uh, with the US pulling out of, uh, if we go back in history, the Kyoto Protocol, which did deliver significant international finance through its clean development mechanism. Um, and then more recently, obviously, uh, Trump. And I think we underestimate the damage that's done. On the positive side, most of the rest of the industrialized countries did stick with their commitments under the Kyoto Protocol. They did all deliver. There was 100% compliance with the Kyoto Protocol. Thanks, Professor Grab. We love to hear your initial point. Unfortunately, we ran out of time for today's panel discussion. 最富有趣味的一门科学。前方桥下闯红灯摄像。有人会把应急车道当成超车道。没事儿，这儿没探头，就走应急车道了。你的意识之变，真的比救助生命更重要吗？请勿占用消防应急通道，合理使用紧急逃生开关。生命通道，只为生命而行。感知全球脉动，世界在你指尖，世界在你耳边。这里是中央广播电视总台环球资讯广播。保持知性，要做到耳听八方，您需要一个贴身的方走路，限速摄像，限速八十。汇集全球热点动态。及时整合主流媒体先锋评论，方寸之间，让你感知全球脉动。环球资讯广播。
世界在你耳边。前方土路闯红灯，剩下二十点。这里是中央广播电视总台环球资讯广播，世界在你耳边。一百点出，第一机车道开照。前方限速设下，限速八十。前方主路限速设下，限速八十。国务委员、国家防汛抗旱总指挥部总指挥王勇率有关部门负责同志，于七月三十一号晚赶赴河南省，检查指导防汛救灾和受灾群众安置等工作。当地时间八月一号，联合国阿富汗援助团通过社交媒体发布声明，呼吁塔利班全面调查此前发生的联合国驻阿富汗赫拉克省办公室遭袭击事件，并要求追究肇事者责任。上周五，联阿援助团在赫拉克省的办公室遭遇枪击和火箭弹袭击，导致一名保安死亡，多人受伤。缅甸国家管理委员会主席米昂莱八月一号发表国家管理委员会执政满半年的电视讲话时表示，下一届大选筹备工作将于二零二三年八月结束，当年年底前将举行自由、公正的多党制民主大选。今年二月一号，缅甸军方宣布实施国家紧急状态，至今已达半年。新西兰总理阿德。前方流动测速区限速七十。上世纪七十年代，主要针对太平洋岛民的黎明突袭行动，向受害者及其家属道歉。新西兰执政党工党。前方主路限速设下，限速八十。种族原因，针对被认为签证无期的非白人展开的。我们来关注东郊运会。今天傍晚，在东郊运会男子一百米半决赛中，中国飞人苏炳添跑出个人历史最好成绩九秒八三，并打破亚洲纪录，在所有半决赛选手中排名第一。进前方主路限速设下，限速八十。中国选手的成绩。一号，中国女子铅球运动员。巩丽娇以二十米五八领先第二名零点七九米的绝对优势，拿下中国奥运会历史上的首枚田赛项目金牌，夺得中国代表团本届奥运会的第二十二枚金牌。另外，在今天的女子三米板决赛中，中国选手包揽冠亚军，施廷茂以总成绩三百八十三点五零分夺得冠军，成功卫冕。好的，以前方主路限速设下，限速八十。目前的情况看，美军的空袭规模、强度很有限，恐怕很难改变阿富汗国内形势。军情头条：美军远程空中支援，难救反恐败局。印度欧亚时报网站七月二十七号报道称，波音公司对于其研发的超级大黄蜂战斗机赢得印度海军舰载机合同感到超级自信，军情聚焦：美国争抢印度军火订单，不仅为赚钱。近日，美国陆军前方走路限速设下，限速八十，用于在战场上最危险的区域与对手交战。目前，该辆车正在新泽西州的迪克斯堡进行测试。武器秀场，无人战车能否引领陆战武器发展潮流？前方走路限速设下，限速八十。次日凌晨五点重播，欢迎您参与话题互动，微信公众号“国际坠屏”。期待您的见解哦！新闻盘点，天下大事，权威解读。各位听众，大家好，欢迎收听《新闻盘点》军事专场，我是钟红。今天节目的嘉宾是环球资讯广播军事评论员魏东旭先生，欢迎。主持人好，听众朋友们大家好。首先来关注本期节目的军情头条：美军远程空中支援。难救反恐败局。
前方辅路限速摄像，限速五十。前方辅路限速摄像。限速五十。空袭的军机是从阿富汗以外的基地起飞，其中包括有人和无人攻击平台。打击的目标除了塔利班阵地，还有对其获取的军事装备。最近几周，美空军第四九四远征战斗机中队大约一半的 F 十五 E 攻击鹰部署在阿联酋的阿夫拉空军基地，已参与有关打击任务。此外，美国空军第九零八远征空中加油中队的 KC 十加油机也参与任务，并和第四九四中队密切合作，甚至有一架 KC 十与多架 F 十五 E 一起飞往前方辅路闯红灯摄像。作为专用加油机留在任务区，一旦第四九四中队准备重新部署，将用一架 KC 十将该中队的大部分人员及相关设备运回本土，并在返回途中为七架 F 十五 E 空中加油。美媒似乎有暗示，有七架 F 十五 E 攻击鹰在执行对塔利班的空袭打击任务。该机是美国空军目前主要的战斗轰炸机，有不错的对地攻击能力。不过，对于大片地区被塔利班控制及交火区域而言，美军这些空中兵力和实际能支持阿富汗政府军的效果恐怕并不乐观。当然，美军还动用了无人机。前方迅速摄像。第五十二 H 战略轰炸机在喀布尔上空被发现。为支持撤军，美国空军早前在中东地区先部署了多架 B 五十二 H。不过，美国国防部官员表示，在过去几天进行了多次空袭，不愿透露进一步的细节。就目前美媒报道显示的空中前方主路，迅速摄像，迅速八十，瓶子等很有限，更像是在做个样子罢了。想要靠美军空袭改变阿富汗政府军与塔利班的对抗形势，可能性不大。军情头条：美军远程空中支援，难救反恐败局。这里是正在播出的新闻盘点。美联社和美国空军杂志近日报道说，超过百分之九十五的美军已经撤离了阿富汗。那么，随着八月三十一号的这个最后期限的临近，美国增加了空袭以支持阿富汗军队。那其中呢 ，F 十五 E 前方辅路迅速摄像，迅速五十。一些相关的任务。最后，先来跟我们说一说美军如何组织针对阿富汗境内的空袭行动。呃，在阿富汗周边，美国主要是利用战斗机和轰炸机。针对阿富汗的政府军，包括安全部队进行空中支援。那么我认为呢，呃，美国空军主要是使用两前方主路迅速摄像，迅速八十。前方公交车道摄像。的一个庞然大物，嗯，主要是针对大规模的地面的空袭行动进行空中支援，进行一些火力打击。那如果说当地的武装组织并没有出现。围攻城市或者是大城市的这样一个情况，那么并不是让人使这个阿富汗境内去进行一些小目标的轰炸，或者是打一些这个零星的这样的一些武装分子的小分队，那么显然是谋遭杀机。所以呢，美国空军主要还是使用 F 十五 E 攻击鹰战斗攻击机，针对这种战术目标进行这种火力支援，进行各种各样的轰炸。那 F 十五呢，它原本是一种制空型的战斗机。已经服役了几十年，但是呢，美国方面一直在对它进行改造和升级。那么 F 十五 E 呢是比较先进的型号，其实呢更加。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。那么它是。
and then we've got the collection section between Dashen Airport Expressway and Beijing Tianjin Expressway on the South Things Room Road. Mm, yes, which is Nan Wu Huan Dian Jie Duan. And, and also Da Xin Ji Cheng Gao Su Dao Jing Jing Gao Su. Yep, that's right. Yeah. And then we've got an, another section, which is the connecting section between Dashin Airport Expressway, Expressway and the Beijing Tianjin Expressway mm -hmm. on the South Six Ring Road. Yes, that's Nan Liu Huan Dian Jie Duan, which is Da Xin Ji Cheng Gao Su Dao Jing Jing Gao Su. And finally, we've got a Dashin North Line Expressway. That is Da Xin Ji Cheng Bei Xian Gao Su Guang Lu. So we do see a lot of sections here going to be open for the pilots of the high-speed testing. And we know that even though there are you know, so many places are open for this, and you probably got to witness them on the road too, but there is a really high access threshold for those uh, high-speed testing of automatic driving. And uh, also they need to be equipped with like relevant devices to access the regular um, the data and also real time data to the control platform in the demonstration area to mm. make sure for the testing is safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's very interesting mm -hmm. because we say this is a kind of kind of pilot zoom. Mm -hmm. So all those high speed automatic vehicles they're going to be driven on specific lanes or designated lanes on the expressway at the same time we can see a variety of such kind of a notice sites will be set up to give a kind of a heads up for all those vehicles social vehicles mm. so you don't have to worry about right. maybe in front of you or maybe back at your car is a kind of a automatic driving cars at the same time for three steps mm. and uh, they gonna be equipped with escort cars oh so these escort cars will be driven on front of this car and at the back of this car so to make sure the 100 percent safe of this automobile driving car if this automatic driving cars can pass the security or safety test then the escort cars will leave and leave the Auto autonomous vehicles to drive by itself. Ah, that really sounds very safe because I believe some of you uh, probably have the thought like, you know, for the autonomous vehicles on the road, it still could be a little bit dangerous for the testing. But here we have to ask our car uh, in front of them and at the back of them to make sure that they're all right. Even, like you said, like after the evaluation, so they can go free solo. Mm. So that is something that you can feel safer about. And also on the testing roads, you can see the signs. So for the other cars, so, you know, with actual people driving in there, you'll be able to distinguish which one is the testing car uh, and there's no driver in it. So you can maybe avoid a little bit too. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, and just now uh, I mentioned probably because the merchants definitely obey all the instructions mm. human beings give to them. So they will abide by the traffic laws and they won't cut into lights. Mm. They won't turn the directions without turning on the lights. Yeah. So to cut all those arrows on the road, probably they're going to just provide a very safe driving. It will but, uh, be, yeah. Yeah, for human drivers, at the same time, we should also think about how to enhance our like uh, driving skills mm. to make sure we're going to be a, a safe driver. Yes. Because we can see a lot of uh, drivers, actually, it's not because they are a kind of a, you know, new thumbs. Mm. Actually, they have been driving for decades, for many years, Yeah. just because they stick to their bad driving habits. Mm. That's why on the road, they still can be caught with the killers. And sometimes they really make a lot of troubles for the cars in front of them or in the back of them. So why and how? Maybe you can just uh, share your tip for your experiences in our chat room. Yes, let us know what is your tip and suggestions to be a better and safer driver. And here after this music break, we're going to come back to share our suggestions to you. Yes, here the song is called Keeping It Moving. Yeah. 
。午睡可使血压下降，心率减缓。可多食用番茄、红苹果、红豆、樱桃、桑葚等红色食物，红色入心，补心气，养心血。按摩极泉、天泉等穴位，宁心安神，宽胸理气。